And welcome back to the Sports Avenue Podcast. This is episode 38. I'm your host, Jimmy Simonis. And today, I have a special guest with me. We're going to talk some basketball. The season just started a couple days ago. I would like to welcome Boomer. Boomer, how you doing, man? I'm good. I appreciate you having me on, man. Yeah, not a problem. So you were telling me that you have a podcast that's about mental health. You want to talk about that? Yeah, for sure. So uh, almost a year ago, we're probably getting close to the one year anniversary. I started the podcast called Unapologetically Me, a mental health podcast, which as you can figure out in the title, it is about mental health. And it was just a way for me to continue to get the awareness around, or I guess, end the stigma around mental illness out there, but also just help myself and others that listen, uh, gain some practical tips on how to enhance their own mental health. And when I say mental health, I don't necessarily only mean related to mental illness, because that's the way a lot of people look at it. But mental health is just how anyone goes throughout their day-to-day lives being healthy and positive uh, up top. So I have people on that might have a mental illness, but they also might have a physical disability. They might be in the military. They might be a therapist. They might just be uh, someone like your neighbor. You know, I just had uh, a bunch of people on from all walks of life, and they just tell their stories and how they get through the daily stressors that they face uh, throughout their lives. So, uh, yeah, I release one episode every week. So we're approaching 52 episodes and it's been a lot of fun. Yeah. So just, we'll just keep, I'll just ask you another question on where can they find your podcast? Where can they find social media and your, what you guys do? So if you just Google, uh, the title, the full title on apologetically May mental health podcast, it'll come up. But as far as social media links, Before I started the podcast, which uh, I guess led to me starting it, I started a nonprofit organization called One A Week that promotes mental health and positivity through kind acts. So we encourage people to perform good deeds at least once a week and then share them with us via our social media pages. And we actually team up with companies that give away sponsored gifts randomly to people that uh, share their deeds with us. And those are the social media links that you can find the podcast through, which are uh, on Instagram at underscore one a week. And that's the number one. So at underscore one a week and Facebook is facebook.com slash one a week challenge. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Boomer, for that sharing that. And so we're going to dive into some basketball now. So Boomer, uh, talk about your journey because you said you played basketball for a, a long time. And how did you end up playing basketball? How long did you play? What did you do? Yeah, so it's not nothing too uh, incredible, but uh, I started playing probably around third or fourth grade. Uh, I grew up in a very athletic family. Uh, my sister is a couple years older, and she was you know, growing up a, a, a local a basketball star, really. She was one of the, the best uh, girls you, you find around. And so when I started playing, I actually kind of sucked, uh, partly because I just wasn't good at sports, but partly because I had no – no confidence in myself, really. And I was intimidated by a lot of people. But, you know, as I got older and older, uh, I got got a little bit better. And we hit high school. I was on the high school team. Uh, ended up having some disagreements with the coach. So I did not finish my uh, high school career on the team, but I joined the rec league and um, was thinking about going to play at a local college uh, where I'm at. Uh, but I ended up not going to school, and then I just played rec ball until I was around 22, 23 years old. And, um, you know, my, my knees weren't holding up. I got, I got the joints of an 80-year-old man, so uh, I had to retire from that and move on to other sports that aren't as strenuous on the joints, specifically the knees. So I, I played for about, you know, whatever that is, 16, 17, 18 years. And around the same time I started playing is when I started watching basketball, whether it was college and the NBA, and I really just fell in love with it. And it's been my number one sport ever since. So, Boomer, you know, you talk about growing up, and I guess you weren't the most athletic, but the passion drove you 
to keep playing. So what what was your passion behind basketball? Was it just something you fell in love with from first sight, or was it something that you just kept developing over time? Uh, it, w- it was over time, I guess. Uh, again, I started, I think, third or fourth grade. And, you know, I, it wasn't that I wasn't athletic, so to say. Um, I, I just I, – it was really just the confidence that – kept me from being as good as I could. And I, I, to be honest, I didn't really work too hard. Once I actually hit like seventh and eighth grade uh, and I had, had a little bit of a growth spurt, I was arguably the best kid in my town because uh, I was a fairly athletic kid, but I was just one of those guys who was naturally really good at shooting the ball. So um, it, it was more just a confidence issue than anything else. But, uh, you know, just once I... I really stuck with it. Uh, that and soccer were the two sports I stuck with uh, up until high school when I stopped playing soccer. But uh, just the the better I got, you know, the more enjoyable it came. And then the more enjoyable, the more I just kept playing and playing and playing. And soon enough, you know, I'm playing uh, five, six, even seven days a week sometimes. And just the more you play, even if I'm not really practicing, I'm just shooting around or whatever, you're just bound to get better. You talk about how you were struggling with confidence. You know, was that just something because you didn't see the results right away, or was just was it just because how you thought you looked to everyone else? No, it was uh, really just how I I looked. I thought I looked to everyone else, but that wasn't just basketball. That was life. Uh, I was as I had as little confidence as you find in any person, and that really started from a very young age. Uh, for whatever reason, and I would say around sophomore, junior years when I really started breaking out of my shell. And don't get me wrong, I was still not confident whatsoever. But, uh, you know, as you get older, uh, at least if you're trying to consciously, uh, you can gain more confidence. And, uh, you know, I would say two, three years ago, I'm 27 now, is when I really found my own and could say I'm a somewhat confident person. And now, uh, you know, if I want to, I can act like uh, I have confidence that borders arrogance, really. So it, it, was, it was definitely not just basketball. It was it was life, but uh, it was something I worked on, which is something, you know, going back to my podcast with mental health, uh, having confidence, I think, is a very important thing. Uh, confidence, self-esteem, and it's something you can work on and build. And that that's what I did. And, uh, you know, I'm better off for it. Uh, obviously yeah for sure so what was your beginnings with struggling with confidence was it due to something that happened I mean if you don't want to talk about it that's completely understandable but I guess what made you start off as that shy timid or shy and timid and wasn't high on themselves Uh, genetics I guess it was it was really since you know the day I can't remember the day one thing I don't know if there was a particular moment or something that happened it was just something I grew. naturally I was someone that really cared what other people thought uh, and I took it too far. Uh, so I can't really point to something that says, oh, like this is what happened because it was it was from day one, really. OK, OK, I, I understand. I, I was just say like I kind of I can see what you're saying because uh, your story because I with your story, because I had the, I was growing up the same way. I'm only 18, but like I always thought that I cared about what other other people thought, and you know that they decide what I do. But at the end of the day, I have to do what's best for me, and you just have to keep going. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and when you talked about when you left, uh, when you quit you know, your high school team, I did the same thing in football. Um, you want to talk about more why you did that, or like what like what that disagreement was about, and was it like playing time or just the scheme that the coach was designing? Yeah, it w- it was definitely playing time you know going into my freshman year uh when I I made the team you know to tryouts went great it was you know me and this other kid who were supposed to be the the two the two guys on the team the go-to guys they were talking about bumping me up to JV and everything and then just a few I was I was a starter and then a few days before the uh, season opener the first game the coach just called me out one day and said I wasn't uh, working hard enough in practice. And uh, he, he replaced me in the starting lineup. And as someone that wasn't confident uh, that 
that that, that ruined me and I think I might have set a record because I still played, but I think every single game uh, my freshman year, I either airballed a shot or would just completely brick it and only hit the backboard. And it was because I was so nervous after I got taken out of the starting lineup that without that confidence, I wasn't going in with that swagger saying, oh, like, I know I should be starting. I know I'm the best out here, that I didn't want to mess up so badly that when you're thinking, that's when you're going to mess up. So uh, I was I was missing a lot of shots that freshman year. But then sophomore year, I came in, and again, not a lot of confidence. So I didn't play much. But about halfway through the season is when I realized, oh, man, like, I'm not playing, like, so so who cares? Let me let me stop caring so much. And that's when in practice, you know, I started making all my shots. I started playing really well. And I never got my opportunity to really to really show them. The only times I would ever get in the game was, I, which is kind of weird because I was essentially a bench player, was they'd stick me in the game with a minute to go when we were down by, like, five or six and we needed a three so they're hey like go in there and try to make something um so I never really got a shot you know to start a game or play earlier on and at that point I was like you know I'm not coming back the following season I I thought about it I actually played uh summer league and summer fall league Uh, but then I was like yeah you know like the the same thing's gonna happen because it actually happened in fall league when the the coaches changed um, I was playing a lot. I was, I was playing great. And then, uh, cause the, the fall league, it's not the, the real coaches cause they're not allowed to practice with the guys until the official season starts. So it's just some like college players that used to play on the team that they would get. And, you know, again, so all through summer and fall, I was playing a lot and then I missed one game and that happened to be the game that they switched coaches. And I came back the next game and, uh, he didn't play me a single minute. So I was like, oh, you know, F this, uh, I'm not coming back. So that's when I just decided to play uh, in the rec league. Yeah, and the, the kind of key talking about confidence, you said that confidence is key, especially in sports where, you know, you have to believe in yourself. You know, granted, you didn't go into the NBA, but can you talk about, like, what confidence means to an athlete? Oh, yeah, definitely. And, I mean, it's uh, we can specifically talk about sports, but confidence is – that's why I said it's so important because it's not just sports. It's uh, everything in life. But, um, you yeah, know, I, I, think, I think I just uh, put the, my finger on it beautifully when I said after I got benched, when I would get in games uh, freshman year, I was so nervous that I would think too much, and that's when I played bad. If you don't have that confidence, it's, you're, you're thinking too much, and – in sports, sports are so much about flow that you do something so many times and you know you're good at it that it just happens. Uh, I actually do a little bit of boxing now. And my first sparring match ever, uh, which I shouldn't have been in, in the ring with that guy, with the guy I sparred because he had done this multiple times. He had been sparring for, or at least boxing for years. And I had been boxing for a couple months. But, you know, he was used to it. He was confident when he was in there. So everything just flowed, but because it was my first time and I had never gotten hit before, I was nervous. And I'm thinking when you just have to be doing, not thinking, which seems like it doesn't make sense. Uh, but if you've been in that situation, you understand. So uh, confidence is huge just just with everything, man. And but by the way, I'm, I'm glad just with everything I do that has to do with mental health and just you know self-growth. Uh, I'm glad that we were able to throw something like this in there, even though it's a sports podcast. Well, no, I think it's a great way to talk about it because I think the mental aspect of sports does get overlooked. I think more in the more recent years is starting to get brought to light in a in a positive way because these these athletes they're they're seen as supernatural because what they do is so uncanny, it's so unique, and it's so it's it's put on a platform where you know the normal person doesn't see them in the same way and but in reality we're all people and I think it's important to recognize that these athletes are people too and that's why I think it's important to talk about that especially with someone that like you that you do have experience you did struggle with confidence and it might not be on the platform of an NBA player you still had to go through what a lot of other players do go through yeah definitely and 
uh, again, I'm, I'm on a much lower level, but when you talk about professional athletes that all their lives are, especially the, the bigger ones, their lives are under a microscope. So just imagine, uh, like baseball players are a perfect example. Uh, a guy might have three, sh- a, a guy that hits, you know, 300, 320, which is very good in baseball, might have three games where he goes 0 for 4, and then people start chatting, uh, he hears it, and then next thing you know, 0 for 4 and 3 games turns to 0 for whatever in the next 5, 6, 7, 8 games, because now he's in his head, now he's thinking too much when he's up at the plate, even though he's done this so many times, so uh, being confident is, is really a skill and an important one in sports. I thought that's why you look at a lot of guys like Kobe Bryant and Michael Jordan, and they almost come off as a little cocky, but you you need that. That's what made them who they were. Right, and de- I mean definitely. I mean, especially when you look at Kobe and Michael, like they ha- like when people talk about that killer instinct, it's just that they trusted themselves. They didn't worry about anything else happening. If it's they put it like if it's if we lose, it's on me. If we win, you know, good. And that's what made them so good. And that's why people do make those arguments against LeBron James when they talk about those two players because people make that argument that LeBron just doesn't have that killer instinct when in reality it's just those two would rather put the game in their hands rather than anyone else. Yeah, and, you know, uh, I, I don't know if I necessarily like the term killer instinct. Uh, I mean, the, the way you're using it is fine, but it's it's because you're using it because everyone else did, but... It's not that LeBron, like at least maybe in the beginning of the year, LeBron didn't have it, which it was really just that that confidence. Right. But he has it now. But like when you said they had that killer instinct to put the the, the game in their hands, LeBron does. He just makes – he really just makes better decisions than, than those guys. Those guys were taking the shot no matter what. Right. Even if they were triple teamed. Mm-hmm. Uh, Le- Le- LeBron wants to take that shot, but if he knows someone's wide open that can hit his shot, he's going to pass it to him because it's the right move. So um, th- that's something I've always had issue with when people say, oh, like LeBron doesn't have that killer instinct. Uh, m- maybe not in the beginning of the year or career, but nowadays he is as confident as anyone in the league, and he should be, of course. Oh, yeah, most definitely. So talk about, I guess, you know, when you were growing up with the NBA, who are some players you idolize, your favorite teams? You know, how did you come about being a fan of the NBA? Uh, yeah, so as we were talking before uh, we started this, uh, I'm actually a Lakers fan, even though I live East Coast. And that happened because I would, uh, I, I didn't know I was doing it at the time, but uh, because I guess I was, a little, I was a little ass of a kid when I was younger. I would always root against the teams my dad rooted for. And the first game I ever watched was the Lakers and the New Jersey at the time, New Jersey Nets, in the NBA Finals. It was either 2001 or 2002. And being East Coast, he was rooting for the Nets. So I started rooting for the Lakers. And I've just stuck with them since through all the – ups and the the downs and there's been a lot more downs than people realize in those years but uh yeah they've been probably my favorite team throughout the last uh almost 20 years now and uh, of all sports I mean and uh Kobe Bryant was always the guy of course if you're a Lakers fan he's going to be which I appreciate him honestly now more than I did back then just because over the last few years as I have gotten into the whole personal development, self-growth field, you really start to start to appreciate a guy who has a work ethic and is really just so brilliant as he is. Like when you hear stories about how he would, uh, he was studying, I think, sharks before he played Allen Iverson because I guess he thought they had that same mentality or moved the same way or something. And it, it, that, that's just the type of thing that, a lot of players would not only never do, but never even think of doing, uh, you know, so a, a guy like that, um, Andre Guadala was, or I guess still is one of my favorite players. Uh, I, I love the guys that outside of Kobe, which I mean, Kobe was a great all around player, but I love the guys that were all around players, but really prioritized defense because I, I was a guy, even though 
my main thing was shooting. Uh, and I mean this honestly, if I could have the choice of scoring or being a guy who scores 25 points a game but doesn't play a lick of defense or being a Tony Allen type player who is the best defender in the league, even though I don't score much, I, I'd be the defender because I, I love that. I love that intensity that those guys bring. So a guy like Andre Iguodala, Gerald Wallace, um, like I said, Tony Allen, I love Patrick Beverly now. Guys like that are uh, I love. And n- nowadays, LeBron is actually my favorite player. He's on the Lakers, yes, but I just love everything about him. O- on the court, yes, but really off the court. Everything he brings off the court I think is absolutely incredible. Yeah, you're, and what I want to do want to ask you, um, when you talk about the NBA, it's all it's always about scoring. It's about looking flashy. And what you're talking about, you're talking about the guys that are the grit and they're the backbone of a team. I guess how do you? I mean, like, why would you want to, as as a person, why would you want to be that backbone when in reality you could be the star, you could be the, you could be the the superstar that everyone looks at. Um, you know, I, I definitely would have to think about the answer, you know, get really deep within myself, but, uh, th- those guys are the unsung heroes and yeah, it's cool to be the guy that everyone talks about, you know, everyone sees all oh, like, yo, he's so good. He's so good. But y- yes, people do talk about those other guys cause the other guys are great players, but th- they really are, like you said, the backbones of teams and a guy like. I don't want to say Kobe because he was a great defender, but um, for, for all, all the real NBA fans, uh, people probably forgot about this guy, but uh, someone like Kevin Martin, who had a two, three years when he was in the league, who scored around 25 points a game. Uh, he didn't play much defense, so his 25 points would mean nothing if it wasn't for the guy that was locking up the player Kevin Martin should have been defending. Uh, yeah, I, I, just, I just love, uh, I, again, I can't really – put my finger on it off the top of my head I'd really have to think about it but uh, I, I just love there's something about it that I just love no I, I completely respect that perspective because in you know when we talk about the modern NBA it's not it's you, like what you're saying is completely opposite of what it is now so that's why I kind of thought it was so unique and so interesting that you brought that up um, what do you think about the Lakers going into this year since we're talking about the Lakers and LeBron what do you think about how they are going to do this year and they just, they're coming off a loss against the Clippers yeah, well, uh, as far as the loss, uh, just as I was expecting, everyone's overreacting. I saw a, a headline uh, that said Stephen A. Smith still has hope in Lakers and, and LeBron James, even though they just lost a, a, one single game that the home opener. Right. Uh, or not the, the home opener, the season opener. And people forget that they didn't have two of their better players, uh, actually, which is crazy. Of the players that played, I think they played um, 10, 10 guys. Only three of them were on the team last year. So this is not only a brand new team, but they have a brand new coaching staff. So everything's brand new. They played, even without Paul George, probably the best defensive team in the league and still a very good team without Paul George. Uh, and the, at the end of the day, they just they they played to the same level as the Clippers. They just... Uh, missed more shots in the fourth quarter. That's really what it came down to. LeBron and Anthony Davis weren't hitting their shots. But, uh, I mean, it's clearly championship or bust this year. Last year, if they had made the playoffs and won a round or two, that's really all you could have asked from a team that had so many young guys. But this year, they have a great team. They probably have the most depth in the league. Uh, Again, they have two two stars, probably two of the top five guys in the league. So it's it's really championship or bust, and uh, you know I guess depending on how you want to look at it, fortunately or unfortunately, the other team in LA is pretty damn good, might be better. So they're definitely going to have to work for a championship. Yeah, not to, and not to mention that they have a brand new kind of regime too, because Magic Johnson left. So they're trying to work with a brand new regime. I mean, all three levels are pretty much brand new. So when you try to say championship or bust, the odds are already stacked against them because they have to fight through. They have to genu- They have to g- generate chemistry among all three phases, and that's not going to happen within one game. No, it's it's going to take it's going to take time. I mean, you look at um, 
the Miami teams that LeBron was on with Wade, their first game was against the Celtics, who I guess were probably to the Heat as the Clippers are to the Lakers this year, and the Heat actually lost. Now, yes, the Heat lost in the finals that year, but uh, again, it wasn't they lost game one of the season, and then all of a sudden, uh, you just throw the season away. They're not going to make the playoffs. Uh, no, they still made the championship. And if it wasn't for a choke job from LeBron in that finals, they would have won it. So, uh, you know, you really got to give this team a solid 10 to 15 games before you can really judge them. And even then, around 10 to 15 games in is when Kyle Kuzma is going to be coming back from injury, who is going going to be their third best player and third leading scorer. So, uh, again, they're, they're going to make the playoffs barring any significant injuries. So it's just, uh, you know, a matter of making sure everything flows and just keeping defense consi- consistent. So you're talking, you know, you're obviously you're a big fan of Lakers. Are there other teams, or at least going into this year, that you're keeping your eye on or you think that might shock some people? Well, I don't know if you would call the shock people because a lot of people were actually picking them to make the playoffs but before Zion Williams uh, Williamson's injury I was uh, strongly considering the Pelicans as a playoff team but uh, with him missing you know 20 to the first 20 to 25 games of the year uh, and he was going to be if not their best player second or third best player um uh, I, I would have definitely considered them making the playoffs, but uh, if there's one sleeper that people might not be looking at, uh, it, it's tough because there's so many teams that can win the finals or win the finals, uh, at least make it to the finals. But the bottom of the league is still uh, not that good. I, I'll, I'll give you two. One team, I'm not saying they'll make the playoffs, but I think they're going to be much better than people think because they are considering them to be the worst team in the league, and that's the Charlotte Hornets. Uh, Everyone's been uh, giving them a hard time about the contract they gave Terry Rozier, but uh, they actually won the first game, and I would not be surprised. Again, I don't think they're going to be very good, but people are talking about them winning 10, 15 games. Uh, I would not be surprised if they're in the mid to upper 20s, which, again, not good, but uh, that's still pretty significant to what people are thinking. And as far as a possible playoff team people aren't talking about, um, I would say maybe maybe the Kings. Uh, people are talking about them a little bit, but it's just tough with how deep the West is. But, um, you know, Darren Fox, I think, is – on the verge of becoming an all-star already. Buddy Heald is a great shooter. Uh, they got players. They got some young guys. So uh, I don't think they'll make the playoffs, but if there is a team that is a sleeper, uh, I would pick them. And, yeah, you mentioned some two teams that have been struggling for the last few years, and now they have to try and figure out a way to get into the playoffs. Uh, so yeah. with the free agency period of the last year, a lot of teams – Instead of making the gigantic super team, a lot of teams created duos. You know, Russell Westbrook and James Harden, um, LeBron James, AD, uh, the Mavs with KP and Luka Doncic. Uh, what do you think could be or and will be the best duo this year? Uh, well, I think the best duo this year will be LeBron and AD just because I think they are two of the top five guys in the league. I still think... LeBron is at least the second best player. Uh, I think at this point Giannis is the best. But um, outside of those two, I think I'd put Kawhi Leonard uh, three. And then after that, I'd probably put Anthony Davis four. So I think that's the best duo. Um, I I will say, though, I did forget about them. I would actually put Dallas as a sleeper. No no one's really picking them to make the playoffs. But uh, I think uh, Luka Doncic is going to be uh, incredible player. I would not be surprised if he's an all-star this year. And Porzingis, if he can stay healthy, we all know what he can do. Now he just has to do it consistently. Um, so they're, they're going to be great. But as far as the top duo, I would still say it's got to be LeBron and Anthony Davis. 
Yeah, I mean, it's tough to argue when the, those two guys are both over 6'8 and can pretty much play almost any position on the floor. And they're both so athletic, too, that it's, it's really tough to stop those two. I can't really argue with that at all. Oh, yeah. If, if they're both hitting their jump shot, which uh, it happens more consistently than people think. People still like to look at LeBron as a poor shooter. Yeah, he shot the ball pretty poorly from the free throw line last year, but he's actually become a above average to even good some years three-point shooter. And Anthony Davis has each year gotten better and better at shooting the three. So if they're hitting their three, they're uh, almost unstoppable because, again, like you said, they're tall. Uh, they can handle the ball. They're just athletic. They're strong. And uh, they, they have a low post game, and, and uh, you know, all they – all they're really missing is that lethal three-point shot, but there are games where they have it. All right, so I think that's going to conclude our NBA talk, but I do want to ask you, what do you think is the most important attribute as a basketball player? What do you think a basketball player must have to be successful? Uh, well, I guess we can bring this full circle, and I, I would say confident. That's what I'd say for any sport, and that's what I'd say for most professions, really. Just believing, believing in yourself is – again just so important for anyone to not only succeed but just have a fulfilling life in my opinion so just having that confidence and belief that every time you go out there every possession you think you're gonna be able to do what you want to do uh, I, I don't think you can top that all right and I, you said earlier that you're doing boxing can you talk about boxing because like I, I'm, I'm a boxing fan so I just want to hear like how sparring's gone I did a little bit of sparring I'm um, not going to say it's my favorite. I wouldn't mind. I don't know if I would do it again, but I just want to I just want to hear about how it's been for you. Well, so uh, I've actually taken, taken a bit of hiatus from it only because in that first sparring session, which was actually July, I was so tense when I was in there. Again, I have never been in any type of fight in my life. I had never been hit. And I had only had about 20 boxing lessons. I, I was going once a week. So uh, 20 and you know, 20 weeks isn't the same as 20 and three or four weeks that you're actually not going to get as good when they're so spread out. So I probably shouldn't have been in there, at least with someone as good as that guy was. And I was so tense that uh, I think when I turned to throw a punch, because I was so tense, I actually, uh, I don't think fully because I've been able to walk on it, but I think I partially tore or sprained something in my knee because ever since then, uh, my knee has been terrible. Uh, I, I can't really move much. So uh, it's it's kind of stopped from there. But I, I do love the challenge of it. I love the conditioning aspect of it. Uh, it's definitely fun hitting pads. Uh, you know, getting hit in the head is a different story. If it wasn't for all the CTE talk nowadays, I probably wouldn't mind it because, you know, I'm sick in the head like that. But with that, I definitely um, – tried to stay away from it especially after the first whipping I took uh so it's 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 fun though I just again anything that's challenging um I'm I shouldn't say anything but most things that are challenging I'm pretty much up for and even if it's not actually sparring in the ring just the conditioning aspect of boxing because it is a very grueling sport from a conditioning aspect and that's conditioning physically and mentally. Uh, I'm, I'm all for So I, I definitely love it from that aspect. So being able or having been boxing for a little while, have you? what are some of the big differences in terms of staying conditioned mentally and physically compared to basketball? Uh, it's – basketball is – because it's a 48-minute game and you have more breaks – it is more of an endurance sport than boxing, which is, I don't know if I want to say explosive, but it is, you know, you go for two or three minutes, depending on how you're training, and you're just constantly throwing punches, constantly throwing punches, and it's just more intense. So it is different in that way. And, you know, once people, even if it's just in training and you're doing those six, seven, eight, two, three minute rounds, towards those later rounds, you start to throw the punches a little slower. You start to drop your hands. 
And that's when most people start to quit mentally. They can still go physically, but uh, th- th- that that's where it's different for me between basketball and, and boxing because it only takes 10, 15 minutes to get to that point where you say, okay, I'm not going to quit. I'm still, I'm going to throw these punches 15 minutes in as I was throwing them in, in the first minute. Uh, but basketball, you can get there because the last few years I played, I was pretty much playing the entire game. And those last four, if it was a, at least a close game, those last three, four minutes, you're exhausted. But it's for at least for me, it was easier to turn it on every time you got the ball or any time the guy you were guarding had the ball. So um, it's it's definitely different in that way. All right, yeah, so that's going to at least wrap up that discussion. And I guess I wanted to ask you one more question. You know, what is some advice, I guess, you can give to athletes that are struggling with confidence and they can't get things going? Because at the end of the day, like you said, confidence is key for almost any or pretty much every athlete because it's what gets them over those struggles. Uh, the quote or the term, whatever you want to call it, fake it till you make it, is I, I'm not a huge fan of in most aspects of life, but with confidence, it, it's it's the best thing you can do. Uh, not only actually training yourself to be more positive and confident, which just involves every time, at least for me, every time a negative thought would come into my mind and I recognized it, I would just instantly replace it with a positive one. And it is annoying because you'll realize if you are a negative person and not very confident, You'll see yourself, even after you replace one, 10, 20, 30 seconds later, already thinking negative again. You just have to constantly keep doing that. But over time, if you just do it and do it and do it, you'll start to see that you are now more positive naturally. And it, for me, it took like six months to even notice a change, which, again, it doesn't sound like it's stressful or exhausting, but it really is to have to constantly do that. But after six months, I started to notice I wasn't having as many negative thoughts. And just the more you do that, it's been, as I said, two, three years now. And I'm a pretty confident person. So just practicing being more confident and positive. And then, as I said, fake it till you make it. Even if you're not confident, just have that swagger, you know, that Conor McGregor swagger when he walks into a ring with that funky walk. Uh, you, You just make it seem like you do. And again, that will eventually trick yourself into thinking, oh, okay, wow, this guy actually is confident. Uh, and it, that'll just help. So it, it's, just, it's just practice, really. Yeah, uh, I, I want to say again, Boomer, thank you for joining. Um, it's been a really cool episode because it does give a different perspective, you know, talking about, I think, the, the theme of it being confidence between all, you know, all athletes. And I just want to say thank you for giving that type of perspective because it is not talked about a lot or enough. Because everyone just thinks, you know, it's just the athletics or it's just being physically gifted when in reality the mental aspect is just as important as being the physical aspect. Because if without the mental, how are you going to get over those obstacles that you uh, that are going to come your way at some point in life? Yep, absolutely. And I appreciate you giving me a platform to speak about it. Oh, yeah, not a problem. Uh, before you head off, do you want to plug any so- uh, social media that you have that so people can continue keeping up with your information? Yeah, I'll just uh, say again, uh, Instagram is at underscore one a week. That's the number one, at underscore one a week. Facebook, facebook.com slash one a week challenge. Uh, you can find just positivity, inspiration there. You can share some good deeds with us and m- maybe win a gift. So, All right, yeah, sounds good. Um, Boomer, I want to say just thank you again for joining. It's been, a, I, it's been honestly a pleasure being able to, for you to talk about your story you know, your background. I just want to say thank you again. And I appreciate it. Absolutely. Yeah, so that is going to conclude the 38th episode of Sports Avenue. I want to just say thank you again to Boomer. It's been a pleasure talking to him. Anyways, guys, thank you for tuning in to the 38th episode of Sports Avenue. I've been your host, Jimmy Simonis. Keep listening to the episodes, guys. They're going to keep getting better and better. Follow, I'll plug in all the social media in the description below as well as Boomers. Guys, have a great day. Have a great week. And don't forget, the road for sports starts here.